song is rocking it. I just love that on the dock. Give me some Otis in the house. I'm Pastor Troy, and you're on the dock with us today. We've got a great show for you. Can't wait to get you out of here. But right now, we want you to come on into the shallows with us because we're all about conversations in this nice dock area on this table around here to get you out. When we're done here, we'll get you out past the past, out into the deep, doing the things of God. So we're going to get you out of the shallows and into the deep, but hang out with us a little bit here, and let's do a little learning together. This is going to be one of the most learning informational episodes that we have ever done at On The Dock. It's going to be really good. It's going to be good. we got a great team in here. we got our own host team in here. And I don't know where you're at right now, but if you're watching us on YouTube, thank God you found us. You get to look at us. But if you're on Spot, Spotify or iTunes, we're glad you're listening to us. We hope we sound good in here. And uh, we'd love to have you on Google Podcasts, Facebook, Roku, Rumble, and SermonNet. If you go to Roku, you have to download the SermonNet app and then go look for the On The Dock with Pastor Troy channel. All of our channels are On The Dock with Pastor Troy. Go find us. We also got social media presence on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Telegram. Make a shout out to us. Make sure it's always nice. We don't only take nice comments. You say something bad, we delete you. We're not into that. We're into good stuff at the Dock of the Bay. And when you find our sites, go subscribe, hit like, notify, share, and make some comments and let other people know about our show. Mother Beth's already shaking her head at me. I'm in trouble already as we get started on this episode. And we'd love to have you as one of our partners. Go to Patreon, download the Patreon app, and you can become a partner or a sponsor at On The Dock. And uh, maybe we'll send you one of these fine coffee cups from On The Dock that I got here, and uh, we'll get one of these to you at some point in time. Fill that out. Check that out. Oh, here, I'll show it to you. Lucas has got me on camera there. They're on The Dock, you want one of these. Great stuff. And go fill it up with something good to drink. If, if you had my pick, you go get Crown Brew. Crown Brew and Marion does a good job. I'm, I'm related to the owner. He's my son. So go there, and my if you son. want, best son too. Yeah, we share. We, we're both we're both his parents. <laughs> so hey, look, you can find out more at on. I know I said my wife's already chewing me because I said on the dock of the bay. I said that on the beginning because it was the music. Yeah, it just gets it gets me in there. But okay. we're on the dock. My wife, we're. I don't okay, want you getting in trouble. Just in case we're on the dock with Pastor Droy. <laughs> but today. You can find out more about us at onthedock.org. You can email us at info at onthedock.org. If you go to onthedock.org, you can find our link to Patreon. You can find our links to all our platforms. You can also see our embedded viewer and so much more you can find out about us. And we have got a big, big task, big task ahead of us. The task that we're taking on is a Christian view on intersectionality. Intersectionality. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to have multiple episodes here. You're going to want to dial into these. You definitely want to hit subscribe, like, notify. You don't want to miss any of these because these are going to be really good for you. We're going to start today with a primer. A primer means just we're going to do an introductory course to try to get you around the understanding of it. So we're going to tell you, you know, where it came from and what the definition of it is. And, and then we're not going to really get into kind of prescriptive stuff yet so much in this. But what we're going to do is kind of take a look at it so we can have a real dialogue around it. So that's what we're going to do first here. What is intersectionality? And I am on the dock today with my lovely bride mother beth to my right i've got back to the back right corner our executive producer donna kronuski hi donna donna you feeling better donna's got a little bit of headache today yep, yep. Yeah, okay you float along you guys see her kind of check out she's she's floating <laughs> some some migraine medicine that's okay and uh we got back in the corner back in the corner there so oh, i don't even put your picture up. there's your picture and to my across from me is my my brother from a different mother yeah, we're both brothers in Christ, is Ernest Hale. I love this picture. I picked this picture from his stuff because he looked the coolest. We could go, Him and I could go to Memphis and Beale Street, sit down. We could, we could listen to some music at BB's tonight in that hat. <laughs> I, I don't look as good in that hat, but I, I, I tried to wear it. I got, I got one that says Steelers on it. Ernest's, <laughs> biggest, er, Ernest's <laughs> biggest flaw is, Ernest's biggest flaw, he's a Chicago Bears fan, you know, but other than that, that's a beautiful thing. No, 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 no. Uh, Steelers all the way. Steelers, Steelers. And uh, hey, right and, and I don't have a graphic up for him. Maybe he can bring up his own graphic. I don't know. We've got Lucas Winkler here as our executive director today. He's in the in the booth. Eventually, we're going to get a camera on him and a mic on him. We're working on that. So his mama wants to see him. Ernest, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us where you're from, what you do, what you're all about, and just give us a little coordinates. Well, like Pastor said, I'm um, Ernest Hale. Uh, there's a middle middle initial there. A stands for Anthony. Um, I'm 59 years old. I was born in the city of Chicago. I don't want to take up a whole lot of time trying to explain about my background. I grew up basically poor. Didn't know it though because everybody around me was, you know, we were all the same. So we didn't. Nobody knew it until we got older. But uh, I've been in Southern Illinois since. 
1990, 91 or so. I've been with this church as uh, an employee for, I told Pastor, eight years the other day, but it's, it's only been seven oh, as of next you? month. Okay. It's been seven years. I'm the uh, building and grounds manager here at Community of Faith. And I'm actually involved in a lot of stuff that goes on around here behind, behind the scenes, um, helping to get stuff, you know, done. I'm, my basic job is to keeping up with the building and the grounds as best I can. Uh, this summer, I just so happen to have a couple kids working with me, helping me around here, a program we just started. Hopefully, it'll continue into next year uh, and the years to come, whereas the kids can come and work over the summer, those that need it, you know. But uh, there's not a whole lot. I, I guess I'll talk more about myself as we talk about some of these issues because, you know, some of the stuff directly affects me. Some of it doesn't. But as we go on in this talk, I'll, you know. Well, tell us about, okay, I was on, I was on your stuff and I ran across this picture. Now, th this, this looks like, I mean, this ain't, this ain't your baby, is it? No. I mean, this looks just like you. <laughs> yeah, that, that and, just so happens to be me. And, and, I, and, I the, and, and who's this classy woman? Oh, that's my mama. That's Betty Jean Hale. I love the photo. And uh, I guess I must have been about two or three years old on that photo. Yeah, that's So a fine I guess photo. it was um, 1964, Betty Jean. Five. Yeah, I got Betty her. Jean. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank, thanks for sharing that. You put that on Facebook. I stole it. So I like, I just love the pic. I love the picture of seeing his little boy. You know, I just know, I just know the old gray haired man. Mm -hmm. I mean, to see the young, to see the young version, you look good. You know, you know. All right. Praise God. Guys, we, we have got a good one for you. Uh, we're going to be looking at this whole thing of what is intersectionality. So as, as a primer, I just want to set some groundwork, I think, for us to get in the conversation. Number one, just throwing this out to the table. Anybody can chime in you want. We typically go left or right with Beth being last and go around this way if we want. Um, the first question I got is, is there discrimination? Do you, do you think, is there, is there discrimination? Let's just get that out there real, real quick. Simple answer is yes. 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 That's my bet. Absolutely. And I, I hear people try to say, well, there's not a lot. I, I, I think you, then you need to get your head out of here. Sand. And we, we also should note that discrimination is not just a white or black thing. Absolutely. You know, yeah. so, I mean. Male, female, could be cultural mm -hmm. discrimination. Mm -hmm. Lots of ways, but poverty mm -hmm. levels, mm -hmm. people discriminate. Ability, Ability or disability. disability. That's right. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. Is, is there systematic? We hear the word systematic discrimination a lot today. And I'm going to add to that. So is there systematic discrimination where... You know, where the system works better for some people in this circumstance and other people in this, but over here it may work better for them than in that. Is there systematic discrimination? Put in that context, I'd say yes. Uh, it's better than it's been, uh, but yeah, it, it still exists in some forms. Donnie, you agree? Yes, I do. Beth? Yeah, me too. I, I, there was systematic discrimination. I experienced it when I went to seminary. Mm -hmm. I was a male, male, heterosexual, married, white pastor. And I was the most unpopular thing in my seminary. Yeah. At that time, the, the female pastors were the hot thing. Mm -hmm. And so everything in the seminary was built around the really predominantly the white female pastor at that time. Wow. We didn't have, I didn't see a lot of, we had one or two black female pastors in, in the Methodist church. But my seminary was totally bent over backwards to the point that we were honestly discriminated against anything we could do because they were they're, they're, the, the move forward for women was so strong at that time. Maybe it needed to be, maybe it didn't need to be, but I felt the effects of being, uh, I thought, man, I mean, I was told by my advisor many times, you're, you're not going to get that class. You're not going to be able to get that church. Uh, you're a white male, married conservative. You know? <laughs> so, so if you don't think there's, there, there's, there's all kinds of systematic mm -hmm. in seminaries in academia, in, in the world politics, I think now, next one is America. Is America, our United States experience, are we systematically flawed toward discrimination? Do you think we're systematically flawed today toward discrimination? Short answer for me would be yes, but then I'll put the caveat on there by saying not as bad as it used to be. Of course, right. things aren't as bad as they used to be. So, I mean, you know, uh, and like I said, I'll talk more about myself in, these, in this process. Being a 59-year-old man, I can remember as a child seeing the, the water fountain signs that still said black and white. I'm old enough to remember that. I how, how long, how, when's the last time you saw one of those signs? Oh, well, I, you know, I was a little bitty boy. Well, of I've, course. I've seen those signs in my children's life. Yeah. We, wow. Where I went, when I went to seminary in Georgia, our wow. doctor's office See. had those signs in yeah. it. Yeah. And the barbershop. That's in 1992 wow. and 93. Yeah. 
We left that community in one year and 10 months, less than two years, because we didn't want to live there. See, you know, I did not no, know no. that. We lived where they had separate waiting rooms still in the doctor's office. We lived in a barber shop where it said, no black people. Wow. I, watched the, I watched a black man come in one day, just stumbled in for something, and I watched how those guys talked to him. Yeah. I didn't know to that day that that was going on there. When I, did, I took, came home and told Beth, oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, we, we can't raise our kids here. You know, I moved in. I mean, I, I moved in to a town where they put in Manchester, Georgia, 1992. They had the, the state of Georgia had put in a black district superintendent for the schools in that county, Meriwether County. They had forcefully put one in as part of the kind of integration type, type mode. So that's not a problem. The Klan went out and they nailed a cross to his house to set it on fire to discourage him from moving in. This is the week before we moved into our home. The week Shane Bishop was moving out, we were moving in. They nailed the cross to his house. They called for the fire department. Nobody was at the fire department because I think the same guys that, 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 that liked to fire, the same guys that put the fire out. So they were, they were busy, you know what I'm saying? But so to speak, they burnt the house down. But guess what? The Klan got the wrong address and burnt the neighbor's house down. <laughs> God. I swear to you, I'm somebody, telling you. Somebody had one job. One jo- had one job. They had one job. They couldn't get it. I, I don't know if the eye holes in the sheets, they couldn't see the address or something. Just, just. So all I can say to you is it did deter the superintendent from coming there and taking the job, though. Mm. And, and that's it. Ernest, that's in my lifetime. That's in my children's lifetime. Wow. So to say that we don't have systematic discrimination in the world is ridiculous to say we don't. I'm with you. I think it's much better. Donna, what, Donna Beth? Well, I, I echo... I echo what Ernest says, but I would like to add another caveat since we're using nice big words. Um, <laughs> Ernest has upped the ante today, oh, yeah. hasn't he? Um, in the world at large, we're not as bad as some. Yeah, there's some places much different. Okay, not not to say that we should rank everything, no. but um, there are lots of uh, more difficult countries to live in. Cultures, countries. Yes, cultures different. and countries, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's countries where just everybody's poor. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, right. Just like Haiti. You take Haiti, Haiti, Liberia, Honduras. And just, you're not allowed to have these conversations. You're not even allowed to have it. So we're, right. we're free and able right. to talk about right. it. Right, right. And, and I, guys, thanks for just being candid on that. Do you think isms, name the ism, whatever ism we want to talk about, do you think isms are a democratic or a public, you know, like, a, like, a, like our kind of government thing only? Or do you think that isms exist in other class and caste systems like Indian classes, uh, Nepalese, or even in, in when you go to communist Marxist type countries that function like that, like China or Cuba or, or other places, Russia, that do you think isms are limited to just our type of government or do you see it kind of across the spectrum? Short answer, no. Um, isms are not what you may call a democratic or republic or conservative or liberal ideology. I think these isms exist in all aspects of life. Like we were just talking about earlier about, you know, the sexism, racism, um, the uh, help me out here, guys. Uh, some of the other isms. Ageism. 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 Yeah. Disabilityism. Whatever, whatever, yeah, you, want, whatever yeah, so, you want. Whatever you want to live on. So it's like, yeah, those things I don't think we'll ever, ever really be done with ever. Isms will always exist to some extent. We'll come up with something, won't we? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I I, I, I travel places and and we we go to Liberia regularly. We've got families in Liberia. We're very close to we've got an entire school there. We support here at Community Faith, the Hands Hope Foundation. And we've got kids there. It's a completely black culture. There's no shame in being black there. Everybody's black. Their president's black. Right. But in that in that community that we have two Albano students, two Albano kids, they are treated horribly. They're beat Mm -hmm. They're I mean, they're considered to be demonic. They're, I mean, just culturally, they're, they have a very tough life. Sure. We have both those kids, and we've been sponsoring sure. them. And, wow. and so they're your culture. Where everybody's African, but just their skin tone and their mm-hmm. being albino. Their lack of melanin. They have created an ism amongst mm-hmm. an ism. So I think any culture at any level. Well, some of those government systems are based on isms. I mean, that's their <laughs> yeah. foundational. I mean, to say that America is the only one that has that is... Blog. Well, the whole idea of communism is, is social casteism. Yes, exactly. So, so I mean, so we, we're in agreement that isms 
are just something we're not going to get away from it. Human nature. No. The, the right. question is, how do we yeah. cope with it? How do we deal with it? How do we honor God as people that, that love the Lord? So I just wanted to have that as open discussion. Let me get you a little orientated here, guys. I'm just going to try to talk to you for a minute and, and, and kind of give you a little history on this whole intersectionality thing. The intersectionality discussion here, let's break it down. The term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly, and that E should have a little hyphen on it on the end, a little dash. like It's almost like a double E, Kimberly, but it's one E. It got a little tick on it. I couldn't figure out how to make the tick work. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, she's a law professor and social theorist. Um, and in 1989, she uh, coined, she's a, she's a litigator, she's a lawyer. And, and she was basically working on a case. And she developed a concept that, that individual anti-discrimination laws are insufficient to address the experience of those who suffer from intersecting discrimination. So what she was saying there was she was dealing with a case, a legal case, and, you know, you've got, you know, got two people here, and, and, and they may look same skin color, may, may be same sex, but then underneath that, there, there are other issues going on. And as you're looking at the circumstances when you're litigating, everything has in, in law – when you're getting down to determining value, judgment, what you're going to do, there's things called mitigating circumstances. So as you mitigate, those intersection points begin to create different values for, say, how Beth would would, would be seen versus how Donna would be seen versus how Ernest would be seen and how I would be seen. And she would call that intersectionality. And so it, it, that's where it started from. It was a legal process to kind of help people understand this person's suffering has been greater than this person suffering. And, and it wasn't all about that. She, I, I don't think she, I think she was doing a great job as a litigator. I think it's exactly what she needed to be doing. And, and she's representing her client. I think it's a very solid understanding. And I don't think there's anything about what she said that's not true. So, so I, I, I'm going to really upset some people with that, but I just don't. Um, she wrote that, um, let me see if I can do a better job with this. She wrote that, um, I got that. I got that. She, the theory of intersectionality, she says, emerged then really, she didn't start it. But she kind of became the one to put a name on it. Mm -hmm. But the theory itself actually started two decades before that. So go back to the 70s. And it started with the black feminist movement. That's where it started in the black feminist movement. The, 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 the women's movement had a white movement. They had all women movement. And then the black women said, well, we've got different issues than you got. But we're all women. Well, we're all women, but our issues aren't the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of our things are the same. Some of our things are different. And so back then is when you really saw, you know, a difference between the streams of feminism. And, 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 and they felt it was very difficult for, say, a white female to identify with all the issues of a black female. And I, I think to, to not say that's not true is ridiculous. Yeah, right. Yeah, of course it's true. Yeah. It, of course it's true. Right. Absolutely true. You know, I, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. I was a little boy. I rode the buses. I know exactly what went on. And I, I know who, who, whose mamas were who. So, so the mamas had different uh, – mamas are mamas. They'll take care of the kids. Mm -hmm. but, but their experiences in getting to that point are completely different. So, I, I, so, so it started off in the movement to kind of say, hey, the, all things aren't the same. So Crenshaw claims that in order to understand – she claims that in order to understand um, the oppression of black women, using the feministic model here, it's necessary to look at the intersection of blackness and womanhood. So you have, she's black and she's a woman, and, and say you two girls are white and you're a woman, and, and there's, when those intersect, those have a different set of variables that, that apply to one's life experiences. And, and, and so does if somebody has other things. She said, while intersexually began as a black feminism thing, discussion initially, the theory has very rapidly been expanded, and it's being expanded right now. Right now in this year, it's being expanded at almost a breakneck speed. Mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you in a minute. About it. And Go ahead. If I can add that intersectionality is not just the race and gender proponent of it, but there is also the socioeconomic proportion, whether or not you grew up poor or rich, right. whether or not you had a disability, a learning disability, or a physical Absolutely. disability. Absolutely. All these things kind of interact. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, to, I'll tell you, I think that's a very good point. And I, that would be my next point here is that this is expanded now, and it's it's including sexual orientation, age, class, physical. Let me put this chart up. These are just a few of them you can see. Uh, whether you can speak English or not, mm -hmm. your racial, ethnical background, your immigration status, your religious affiliation. 
can be a sectionary, a disability, or, or not, you're, you're disabled or you're not disabled, sexual orientation, today's sexual gender, your gender identity, social economic status. These are all different things that have now been added to the table. And to be honest with you, they're, they're really throwing in more almost every day to the point that, you know, that to be honest with you, the issue between the black woman and the white woman and feminism is almost disappeared. That issue is yeah. almost, I'll be honest with you, has almost been captured. And I, to be honest with you, Ernest, I, I think the issue of discussing the, the, the development of the African-American community is almost being swallowed by lots of other agendas out there for mm -hmm. groups that have a lot more money to mm -hmm. promote their, mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's the word you call it? lobbyist? Right. It's gotten hijacked. It's gotten hijacked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think what makes a lot of our people, in a sense, that Christian people that hear the modern discussion is they see a bunch of things there, isms that we can't quite equate with the Bible. Right. Doesn't mean we don't understand that we all have free will and can do what we want. Right. So I, I teach that very clearly that there are two thieves on the cross. One chose paradise, one chose hell. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't hate on the one that chose hell. He just told the one, I'll see you tonight. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, so free will gives us a right to take the free ride either direction we want to go. Mm -hmm. So people have a right to live their isms out, I guess. But as Christians, we, we struggle with some of those choices because they don't fit the model of what we see as the kingdom of God of the world that we'd like to see. So we tend to block a lot of it out. I do think a lot of the current, what was originally critical race theory, how it started, has been hijacked. And now it's just, you hear critical theory, they've dropped the race out. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like a small thing now, you know. So I, 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 that's a whole different discussion point. Maybe we write that down and talk about that a little bit later because I do think it's been jacked a little bit. And if I may, um, intersectionality also deals with not only the differences uh, and stuff like that and the disadvantages and discrimination, but it also deals with those individuals that have privilege because of certain things intersecting in their lives. Both ways. It, go, it, it runs both. It runs right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Very good. Very good point. Very good point. So, somebody make a note to make sure we come back and talk about the, the hijacking of that later on for me, if you would, because uh, I think that's worth coming back to. But so, so let me keep on, on the baseline. So as Ernest said, I, and I put this chart, let me show you the second chart. So intersectionality takes these things and they identify people and they begin to pull these together and, and individuals will represent multiple spears there. So, so somebody's, somebody might be an uh, Amir is a Muslim youth of refugee status who identifies as gay. So he's got like three points. Right. All right. <laughs> somebody over here is Joey's a white youth with a learning disability who's eligible for, to, for free and reduced lunch services due to family income below the poverty line. So he's disabled. Uh, he, he, he's got an ethnicity and socioeconomic status. So, so all those will have values, almost like a, they're, today. They're, what's really concerning today is they're starting to talk about today a social, social cr credit score which is scary. You get your, your credit score and then your social. And your social credit score determines whether you're of more value morally, ethically than somebody else. That is a scary conversation. Mm. Yeah. To think that because you have more boxes, some of those boxes, <laughs> my brother over here, he cannot change his skin color. <laughs> he can't get away from it. I can't get away from being white. You know, we just is. There are some things you can make disappear with makeup or, or outfit. I think uh, one the one time you and I had a uh, conversation about the fact that you were an Italian individual mm -hmm. uh, of, of Italian descent uh, in America, there was a time when you guys were discriminated against too. Harshly. But we also discussed the fact that the discrimination kind of goes away because you assimilated and became... Lose that Italian accent, learn how yeah. to speak English. Change your name a little bit. Drop the eye off a, the a end. Lot of, uh -huh. A lot of us did. Yeah. And, Benetton, not Benetton. Yeah, like Benetton, my, right. And my grandma was telling, I asked her when I was a child, I found out her parents were German, okay. directly from Germany. And I said, oh, do you speak German? And she said, oh, no, we were never allowed right. to speak German. Not here in America. Not even with our accent. Oh, my wow. par our parents told right. us, no, don't. So, don't so do back, that. back to what, what he was saying about me not ever being able to change my skin color, that's the one disadvantage we have. Right. Yeah, because Absolutely. there's people from all over the world that are here in the United States of America that experienced some of the same stuff that we did, right. but they eventually had uh, were able to 
kind of work through it differently. Yeah, yeah. and change and a few things. The one thing that we can't change. You just can't get away from that. There's right. nothing you can do yeah. about it. Right. I mean, we exactly. know people try to lighten it and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> you know, what's funny is what, what, what we consider different here, when you go to Japan, they, they, Japan and Thailand, they all put on products that all the Japanese and then want to make their skin whiter. Yeah. Ta- whiter. Oh. Uh, some places tan, no, some places don't. white. Oh, yeah. oh they, they cover their skin so they don't get tan. It's it's just, whitener they want to be actually. white. They, they ble- yeah. So the, amongst the Japanese, there's the bleached Japanese and the unbleached Japanese. Yeah. Yeah, it's a but, high. I issue. mean, well, what's, what does that say about society at, it's at large? It's it pitiful. says that <laughs> most Twisted. most of us think that white people have it so good to where we literally want to change our appearance to Ridiculous. be like them, hmm. because I mean, being the way we are kind of comes with all this stuff, you right. know. Yeah. And I, I'm just gonna say stuff because we all know what some of that stuff is, and it's 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 amazing how. I mean, you know, how people perceive that. But it's an, it's a right. self-exalted thing. It's not who God called us to be. We're all children of God. There's Absolutely. no gift, right? So, so it's something that, that the enemy has put on us that we try to live up to something we can't be because no matter how much that Japanese girl tries to whiten her skin, she's still got a Japanese skin under there, right. you know? Mm-hmm. And, and no matter how much... Michael Jackson, that you say, you try to whiten his skin, he's still Michael Jackson. You, yeah, you, you can't Michael run from who Michael claims he had vitiligo. Okay, I don't know. I buy it. I buy it. I don't know. We never saw any of that splotchiness, uh, you know, because we were big, 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 big Michael fan. Jackson yeah. fans back in the day, and we were all kind of like, all of a sudden he's just a different color. All of a sudden, <laughs> where happened to seeing a splotch here or a splotch there every right, every right. now and then? Yeah. that people would that actually have it a lago, uh, you know, they right. experience, right. and yeah. and so that's why most of us thought that he was bleaching his skin mm. intentionally. Wow. Well, let, let me let me dig on this a little bit here. Uh, intersectionality has become the top focus of today. I think it's the hottest thing going on right now. It, it's it's blown past abortion twenty years ago, pro life, uh, pro life twenty years ago, and abortion. And then you've got the the you have the the gay marriage agenda ten years ago, and now this is the agenda. It's the top focus of a lot of social equity work, a lot of activism. You know, activism and community organizers are calling for a more dynamic conversation about differences and experiences among people with different overlapping identities. They have different come from different intersectionalities, so to speak, and. Crenshaw posits uh, in her work that political efforts to end individual uh, to end individual forms of discrimination, such as sexism or racism or classism, uh, will be actually insufficient because they don't take into account the cumulative the cumulative, big word we'll use a lot in this series, cumulative nature of different types of discrimination. So it's just not about our skin color. There's a whole package of stuff that's beneath me, beneath you, beneath Mm -hmm. Donna, between us. And she's saying that's all got to be taken into case. And in some ways that's good because it lets us know we're we're more than one thing. I'm not just white and you're not just black. We're we're the sum of a lot of things in our lives. But we're a lot more than any of these other things I've identified too. So (laughs) we're going to get to that. The answer, according to the promoters of intersexuality today, is is a little bit more that we need to have – more isms, more, more intersectionality. The answer is more social government programs. More, more, more. I'm not saying we don't need programs, but they're saying for every, you got to have something for everything. So, so Pastor Troy is here on the dock to suggest that the answer for us today, just quickly, I think the answer is not to bury our heads on the, in the sand on the issue. I think we need to quit as Christians, as, as believers, as, as anybody. Quit burying our, our heads in the sand. It's not I don't think it's 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 about um, I don't think a government mandate or social programs solves this problem, no, no. ever, no. ever. This goes back to Cain and Abel. They hate each other over the tithe. Over that was over money. You can't litigate it away. You cannot no. litigate, and you cannot mandate people's hearts right. and their minds. I, I just don't believe you can do that. So so let me see if I can get let me get a better understanding because this is a primer. So let me dig in here just real quick here. Intersectionality, I got on the screen here, is a framework, a theory for conceptualizing a person, a group of people, or social problems as affected by a number of discriminations and a disadvantage. You see all those different issues there. And some will, some will have these and those, and some won't have those and these. It takes into account people's overlapping identities and experiences in order to understand the complexity of prejudices they face. It also could be, I think Ernest was right too, privileges they have. Oh, absolutely. 
But either way, it creates a plus or minus moral authority score. That's the modern day concept. That is not necessarily what Kimberly designed, but it's the modern day concept. Now, a simple definition, just to give you a simple one, is it's a complex way in which an individual's identity and multiple forms of discrimination combine, overlap, or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or group. Really, it's it's the way we intersect for all groups. I don't know why they say just marginalized groups, because everybody has these different things, whether they're out of privilege or they're not out of privilege or not. And Oxford, let me go a little farther. Let me get Oxford in here just because so we, we are in a primer, so I want to be educational here. The Oxford def, 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 uh, definition of intersectionality says it's a complex way in which an individual's identity and multiple forms of discrimination combine overlap. That looks real similar to the last one, doesn't it? I must have messed that up there. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. I did something wrong on that one. So we'll, we'll look at that. Let me see if I can find can that. Can I read the, uh, one I wrote down? Yeah, pl yeah please. It says intersectionality. An analytical framework for understanding how I, how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and privilege. See, I think that's a really good definition. So when I, when I get it done, I'll maybe fill that in and put that on here. That's a very – see, I think that balances it up a little better than a lot of this. So I, I pulled these just from general stuff. Re read it one more time because we got we don't have it up on the screen. And we get people listening. An analytical framework for understanding how aspects of a person's social and political identities combine to create different modes of discrimination and or privilege. Okay. Does anybody really have a problem with that definition? I don't have a problem with that definition. Mm -mm. I mean, this isn't into theory. This is just telling you what it is. Mm -hmm. Right. That's reality. We, we're all agreement that's reality. Okay. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. yeah. I, 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 again, I'm struggling with a lot of Christians today. Just don't want to talk about the whole subject. But I, I, I think if you, if, I think we get to the truth of it, we may have different ways to solve the problem of making life better for everybody. And I think that's where we're going to find out there's a little bit of difference. I don't think, I, I, I don't think everything's going. I don't think the government's going to fix this. I don't think we can legalize it, legislate it. I, I do think we're going to have to change people's hearts, but we're going to have to do that by being witnesses ourselves. Go ahead. And can I make another comment uh, as far as about uh, Professor uh, William uh, Crenshaw? Yeah, William, please, William's please, please, Crenshaw. please. This lady uh, is a graduate of Cornell, Howard, and the University of Wisconsin, and she currently teaches at UCLA. Yeah, very so distinct. Like, she's very distinguished. Yeah, so it's very not like she's just some no, Joe she's, Smoke. No, she's, she's a she, well-learned person. She, she's top-notch. No, yeah. I, I, I thought her was top-notch. And I think her legal theory is top-notch. I, I don't think I don't think you can critique her in this at all. Yeah. I, I, don't, right, I, don't, right, right, right. I don't have a critique for her in this. I think well, you know, a lot of people like to try to kill the messenger. Yeah, and, 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 and I don't yeah. think that's fair. I think she was just doing what, what I would hope my lawyer would be that sharp. Yeah. I hope my lawyer would look at my life and, and, and want people to understand who I am and the complexity of who I am. Absolutely. Because right. we're all complex people. You know, I, I, I can, I can hit, you know, I relate to that. Let, let me let me do this. Uh, thanks for that definition, Ars. That was very good. Intersection has become the dominant theory um, in in higher education today. Don't when you agree, higher theory, higher education right now, I mean, this is the language of the culture of the campus today. And and it's becoming a very defining of human relationships. And I got this chart that I thought was really good because it works with domination line and you know and then below that is the oppression group and the above group as he talked about is the privilege group. And you can kind of see if you look if you find females to the far right here bottom Go follow that line all the way up. Then you see. Then you see on the other side. You'll see. Uh, it, you'll you'll find the males on the other side. So those lines actually go across to the other side, and they show you the degree of what's the worst and 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 best. So it, down to the top, the center one being credentialed and non-credentialed. So basically, literate, non-literate. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, to, I, I I am intrigued by the fact that when you take a look at this version of the chart, the worst, the person that's in the worst condition is illiterate. And the person that's the best is literate. Doesn't matter what your sex, race, creed, gender, anything is. I would totally agree with that. That when somebody is too. ignorant, they've not been able to learn or be able to receive learning. Maybe they can't take learning. Maybe they didn't get the opportunity to learn. Yep. Right? Yep. Either way, th th that is the worst thing because you don't even know who you are. You know, you don't even know what opportunity there is. Whereas at the top of that, when you have credentialed stuff, you have lots of degrees, you know, you, you, you get sharp, man. You, you, can, you can make it. So I thought this was a really good chart I saw on this. And what I wanted to point out was that it, it really kind of divides everyone into, I mean, all of us can have things we're up on and down here. I mean, I, I mean, all of us can have things we're up and or down here. Everybody can. It just depends on what, what your thing is. And, you know, you know I mean, look here. 
Ernest, old. Old's on the bottom. You and I are getting old. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, eventually we're all going to get on the bottom and we're not going to be able to fend for ourselves and we're going to become. So, there's there's the poor, the widow, you know. So, there's a lot of things there that we can really look at. So, um, imagine being old and illiterate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, oh, I, don't you feel for that? And, yeah. you know, as you get old, a lot of us move into illiteracy because we can yeah. no longer remember and think. Right. Mm-hmm. And we see that with people yeah. with Alzheimer's yeah. and how right. sad it gets it true. when grandma loses her faculties and doesn't remember. To, you know, we've seen we, we've seen that with her dad, you know, not able to feed himself, you know, at the end because you don't remember how to use a fork. And, we, wow. we don't, you know, I, I just hope the Lord takes me before them. But some people don't get that. Can I interject one more thing sure. about uh, Please. Prof- Professor Crenshaw? No, good, great stuff. Because... This lady, I don't think, was talking about herself when she's when she came up with this model because she's no. the child of two school teachers. So no. naturally, her her upbringing was not the same as some kid or some young lady that grew up in the projects right. to a poor single mother household. So she's 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 done the research. She's not speaking from experience, I don't think, because she didn't grow up in 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 that particular environment. Right. She she had a two parent household and they both were educators. She's pretty advantaged. <laughs> yeah. In, in your book, she, but I, yes. she was a lawyer who was was thinking about things from a standpoint of defending a client. Okay. And that's her client. Right. Right. I mean, she was preparing a legal brief. Yeah. So she wasn't actually speaking from experience on these things. These these things were. Studied. This was based out of a wealth yeah. of knowledge, though. Yeah. I mean, it's very well, very well argued. Very no. Yeah, I think that's very good to say. Um, let let me put this in here. Intersectionality, or what they call critical theory, deals with a lot of it today. The theory that concerns me the most, and we're going to get into this more in the next two, next one, especially in number three. Uh, it deals with people by categories: race, gender, uh, as you said, sexual orientation, preference, uh, income, all kinds of other things, right? right? And because some groups of people are more privileged than other groups of people, they have more positive scores than negative scores. Let's say more privileged than oppressed scores, and you add all those up, kind of total them up. Then you begin to identify one's group ultimately by their score. Their, their moral authority is determined by if they have more ups than downs, or more, or in this case, more downs than ups. Actually, the downs actually create a higher score, and, and, and the more oppressed categories become, the more you're oppressed, the more categories you can check, mm-hmm. all right? The more authority, by creating this greater moral authority, it seeks to address the imbalance of power. That's not what Kimberly was arguing at all. Mm-mm. Not at all. She was arguing a different thing. She was saying, we got to take this in when you consider how to handle the situation. Right. The modern theory is that the more boxes you check, the more important you are. Mm-hmm. So the more victimized you are, the actually the more better off you are. And so my concern is I want to be real careful, and we'll transition in part two about this. In, in part two, we're going to get into the Christian view. And I, I really want to take a look at the Christian view on this because there's a lot of Christians responding right now. A lot of it's just ignorant as all get out. Number one, they haven't studied it. They don't know who, who Kimberly is. They, they don't know what she was writing to. Mm-hmm. And so they just blast the whole subject, realizing, you know, you can't get past the fact that we all are made up of lots of different things. That's just common sense. When I, when I meet somebody, I assess them up by what I see right off the bat. Right. You know, they're dressed well. They're not dressed well. Mm-hmm. They, they, they can form a sentence. They can't form a sentence. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah, if they're a Chicago Bears fan or Steelers fan, I, I do a lot of stuff quick. You know, we all do that. We all bring that to the table in, in a way. So we need to look at what we mean here. And so I, I do – what I want to clarify as we wrap up here, and we're going to wrap up here because I'm at 42 minutes on my clock here, and um, I don't know what he's at on his, but we, we're gonna get pushing our limit. But I, I think – this is my comment, and then we'll get out of here. I think all of this – from an awareness standpoint, where, where, where the goal is to give you a primer on intersectionality, and I think there's been a good primer on inter- intersectionality, with what I believe has been helpful, I, I really think it's been great. I think, Ernest, what you've added in has been fa- fantastic. Um, I think that this is important to be aware of because issues arise for me you know, in that I don't have a problem with the study of it or the discussion of it or the right. learning of it. I have a problem with the modern-day solution it just looks to me like an increasing lobbyist effort to make a lot of money for a lot of small group segments. And I almost think a lot of the original issues are being lost, to be honest yeah. with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Being, I agree with yeah. You on that. And so the way to solve it. So my goal here is we go forward is to help us equip other Christians, not to put their head in the sand. Okay. Not to be scared of a real conversation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. trust the truth, but we want to teach people that you need to learn how to honor and you need to learn how to love God and you got to love your neighbor at the same time. Right. And that's so just not, and, and that's not the neighbor that just has the same sectionality as you. Right. All right. Yeah. So let me see if you guys agree or disagree with this. And this will be our wrap up questions. Do, do you think we need to recognize that people have unique experiences from one another? 
for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Do you, do you think we need to recognize that people experience the world differently based on their identity markers? Oh, for sure. sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do, do we need to move away from language that seeks to divine people by anyone? He's a black man. I'm a white man. Y'all women, we men. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We're more than, I, I think we're more than one of those. So we're right. more than, I believe the greater marker is that we are all at this table, children of God. Right. right. If we start there, then we start at the greatest marker. Mm-hmm. Everything yeah. else is just kind of the, the way the father made us to some extent, you know, and, and we need to appreciate our father. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Mm-hmm. Do, let me ask this question. Do, do we, do we need to realize that my life experience, how I was grown up and how I lived is not the baseline for everybody else? Yes. Do I need oh, to be absolutely. mature enough to go, you know, I grew up differently than Ernest did, and different than Donna, and different than Beth. Mm-hmm. Beth's, yes. a, Beth's a farm mouse. I'm a city mouse. You know, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, she, she grew up to a farmer. I grew up to a doctor. Big difference. I grew up in the concrete jungles of the city. That's right. You know, and so yeah. yeah. We, and so I, I think that we need to be open and sensitive to others' challenges and others' points of view. Yes. Everybody think it's fair. Totally and finally, agree. let me last question. We'll we'll get out of here. We need to be comfortable, I think, in recognizing our differences. We need to be comfortable in understanding I am different from you guys, and we need to be comfortable treating one another as children in the family of God, regardless of our free will, and regardless of our destination choices. Mm. Yes, totally. Agree. I need to learn how to love somebody that even makes a decision that I don't agree with. Right, right, right. right. absolutely. And chooses to live a way I don't agree with. Yeah. As long as they're not forcing their stuff on me. There you go. As for me and my house, yeah. we can serve the Lord. Yeah. Joshua twenty four fifteen. Right. Yeah. Does that sound good? Yeah. yeah. I think we're. Good. I think we've. Hey guys, I think we've started this off really good on the dock. I want you to come back and hey, this has been good stuff. You need to listen to this. You need to share this. You need to get this out. You're getting some core stuff here. And please go back and look through this and, and read through it and and just just share it. Uh, we'll be back in in a second episode on Christian view of intersectionality. We're gonna be talking about the Christian view specifically. How do we respond to this as as Christians? And we're gonna take that apart a little bit. Look at it and kind of get into that. And let me just say, we're not doing a good job with it. So so we need to learn how to do that the right way too. And if we were doing things better, we might not have the problem and need other t- people trying to come up with solutions. So yeah. let's come back in part two, talk about what we're doing, what we should be doing, what our father wants us to be doing, and let's see if we can do a better job with that. So uh, Ernest, thank you for your contribution today. As okay. first time uh, co-hosting. On, on the dock. Hey, do I get like any uh, parting prize? You get a cup. <laughs> you, all guys get a cup. I already gave you a cup. I, already got I got one. a cup. I was, Don, I was the first one to get one. Donna, Mother, <laughs> Be- Donna, Mother Beth, Lucas, great job on this show. I don't have a cup. You don't have a cup. Well, Just get, saying. T- today, today you get your cup. Today you get That's your wrong. cup. I promise. Hey, if you've enjoyed this, go to onthedock.org. You can watch us right there. You can find our podcast links to all the platforms as well as all the other stuff about us. And go find us. If you're on YouTube, watch us now. Go find one of the other sites in case they kick us off. Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Facebook, Roku, Rumble and Sermonette. And we'd love to hear your comments on social media. Give us a shout out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. And all those ways, when you find those places, subscribe, hit like, notify, and share on us. And don't forget to go to Patreon, find On the Dock with Pastor Troy, and become one of our partners or sponsors. You can also get there through onthedock.org. And we would always love to have you. If you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you at Community Faith Church. This is the host site of that of that church. And I'm the pastor there. Sunday's 10 o'clock, Wednesday's 630. We have a live church going on it's good church and we'd love to have you if you can't get there check us out online cotv.com we have a facebook and a youtube channel under community faith church we'd love to have you again guys thanks so much we have loved this subject it's going to be great you do not want to miss part two stay with us we'll see you soon on the dot with Pastor.